This week I explore theology and our relationship with something bigger than ourselves with Dr. Jim Cregan, who is a former lecturer of theology at Notre Dame University in Fremantle. Jim explains what exactly the study of theology is and delineates it from institutionalized and organized religion. Jim explains how considering the questions that theology raises helps us to orientate ourselves and develop a stronger you know existential strength and inner compass within ourselves and he also puts forward how this lack of orientation could also be behind much of the anxiety and mental health issues that we see raising today there are, there's a lot more in this conversation jim's a very thoughtful and well thought out uh, gentleman and it was a real pleasure to speak with him so enjoy Jim. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Brit Edwards. Today I have the great pleasure of welcoming Jim Cregan. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yep. So theology is mm. where we're going to go today. Mm. So you are former lecturer in theology from Notre Dame University yeah. here in Fremantle. Yep. Yep. And um, I thought it'd be really interesting to, because I've, I've been sort of going looking into a bit of philosophy. Mm. I thought it'd be also interesting to go into a bit of theology mm. um, in terms of what it is and what we can learn from that, yep. particularly as we navigate our way in a yep. changeable world. Yep. So um, if we start with a basic question, mm. what is theology? Just yeah. so we're crystal clear and we have right. a central coordinate to start with. Yeah. yeah, well, I don't know if there is a crystal clear definition of theology, but if you, if you took it etymologically, mm. uh, words about God. Words right? about God. Words about God, yeah. Now, uh, it's problematic in, uh, because the subject of theology is this thing, this, um, however, experience, um, sense of that we call God. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the uh, you know like the focus and the goal of the of the discipline as it were you know so um, so that's sort of problematic but um, problematic in well problematic in that essentially you are working in an area that is um, profoundly um, intellectual and analytical but at the same time is abstract and poetic mm. yeah. um, but if we uh, I mean in some traditions um, uh, an aspect or a dimension of their theology is precisely questioning whether this thing called God actually exists. You right. know? Uh, the tradition that I am trained in and sit in um, assumes the existence of that which we call God. Right. Um, so that's taken as a given? It's taken as a given, yeah. 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 Um, and then, um, so what I used to tell my students um, was that I'm not about teaching them about God, but I'm teaching them about ways to think about this thing called God. Mm. Yeah. Um, but, and if you, um, you take that a little bit further then, and one of the, or uh, one of the dimensions of um, Catholic theology is that we, or Christian um, theology, Jewish theology, that we're imaged in the likeness of God, um, God the Creator, then um, theology becomes not just about God, it becomes about uh, humans' relationship with that which we call God. And, mm. and then if you, um, again, you know, working with this thing that we are imaged in the likeness of God, then it's very much about um, relations with each other as well. Yes. So um, broadly speaking, as I say, words about God, and of course that includes you know, the traditions and the scriptures and the texts and the, you know, the history and yes. of, that, of that whole, um, that whole endeavor. Mm. Yeah. yeah. How, how does one position theology in relation to what we'd know as sort of institutionalized religion? Yeah. Does one yeah. sit inside the other or does the other sit inside the other? Or um, do, you, do you see where? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, and why I say that is that institutionalised religion, I think, has been um, frequently very suspicious of theology. Right. Um, uh, in as much as because, particularly in the, in the, in the Catholic tradition, it's a questioning, uh, and, and Judaism as well. Yes. And, and historically in Islam as well. And it's about questioning um 
our assumptions and uh, uh, in relation to you know reality and um, I guess the spiritual and the institutional. Um, yeah. And so at the same time that theology has historically always informed um, institutional understandings, mm. um, it has frequently been at odds with it, um, often to the peril of the theologians mm. concerned or the uh, um, so um, yeah you, you know I mean the the current Pope and the um, the, the leaders of the other denominations um, have you know rafts of theologians that, that um, uh, support them mm. um, uh, but often outside of that um, there's often you know I call it you know feels like um, Metaphysical cage fighting at times. Yes, <laughs> metaphysical <laughs> cage fighting. Yeah, it, uh, you know, some of the conferences I've been to and so on. Really? Just, uh, just you know, shocking things. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, um, people often get very attached to their ideas and they get very um, uh, defensive. And, and, of course, if, you know, historically where... I guess the West was uh, essentially a, um, a theocracy of sorts. Um, a theocracy. And, well, I, I mean, the, the you know the the history of the West is large by and large, apart from the large, the last you know maybe hundred uh, and fifty years or so, and and particularly maybe mm. the last um, fifty years has been mm. the you know the history of the the Christian Church that you know uh, in the West and. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, they um, uh, at times, uh, and, and but but uh, the other thing, of course, that our society has been much more um, static than it has been, you know, uh, recently. Yes. Uh, and so, um, if you have a theology that undermines the stability of that social order, um, and at times it has, yes, uh, and continues to. Then it can be very um, it can be very problematic and challenging mm. for those institutions, you know? particularly yeah. if yeah. they're there to bring about a sense of control and organisation, yeah. yeah, yeah, or yeah. controlled organisation, yeah. yeah, and then you're picking away at the assumptions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see how theology yeah. is, mm. um, yeah, can help to promote mm. that, but also question that yeah. and underpin it. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. So it's so it strikes me as being very much about that sort of human relationship with God or something yeah, bigger than us. Yeah, transcendent. Mm. Yeah, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. What? Mm. Um, you know, I, this question is not about you know, does does God exist or not. It's mm. more. I guess my next question would be, what it what is it about us humans mm. that we have need or whatever it is a relationship to something that is bigger than ourselves mm. mystical unknown mm. mysterious yeah 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 i mean um i don't know whether that's more of a yeah almost a psychology Slash no, 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 question, it's not but... at all. I mean, St. Augustine talked about humans having a God-shaped... Well, essentially, you know. Uh, my heart is restless to low, rest in thee, O Lord, you know. Yeah. Uh, the notion that we have a uh, what's been described as a, a God-shaped hole in our hearts, you know. Right. Um, and in many ways, you know, the, the, um, the, uh, the project of humans, particularly within the institutional religions, within, within the scriptures, is very much the... Um, uh, you know, the journey back to Eden, as it were, you know, yes. the, the journey back to uh, unification with God. The, and that'd be the Garden of Eden from where we uh, Yeah, yeah, which was a time, mm. of, you know, of, of, of harmony with God, of, of, uh, of, you know, unity with God and unity with each other and so on. Mm. Um, and um, so, uh, I mean, and, and like a lot of the biblical myths, you know, they describe very, very deep, um, I guess existential, mm. um, I suppose realities um, um, about a sense of loss, um, a sense of alienation, you know, a sense of um, distanciation, mm. um, and so on. You know, um, more recently, I mean, people like Freud or or, or, or Marx or Lenin would describe, you know, that as a um, 
as a superstition or as, yeah. a, as an aberration or, you know, a, the opium um, of the masses. <laughs> that we need to be cured of. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, but um, I think if you, um, you know, if you, you have a sort of sense of God as this, the, you know, the ground of your being, then, yeah. um, or if you like more, more scripturally, um, that which we are imaged in the likeness of, then um, in the same way that, um, I suppose, you know, um, genealogists or uh, are, are very, or genealogy becomes, you know, the hobby of those with uh, time on their hands to explore their family roots. You know, there's, a, mm. I think, a similar impetus to to know the substance of that which we're imaged in the likeness of. You know, the, yes. the substance of our, you know, we're, we're interested in our parents, the history of our parents and our families, and so on. You mm. know, even if it is myth, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, um, we, um, you know, we're storytelling animals, and we we like to have a story that has a beginning and a middle and an end. You know. Yes, we do. Mm. Yeah. And we tell ourselves stories, yeah. and then we collectively tell ourselves yeah. stories. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And what, and one might come back to this mm. later, but mm. one might argue that we're at a period of time where mm. we don't seem to have a grand unifying no, we don't. narrative. No, we don't. And that was uh, something that was celebrated, you know, the suspicion of, they talk about the, you know, the um, hermeneutics of suspicion, you know, which is mm. a, a feature of postmodernism. And of course, um, it, it, you know, everyone's going, oh, hooray, hooray. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, actually, it's kind of, this is a bit lonely and a bit disturbing and a bit, um, you know, that we don't have these, mm. these grand narratives. And of course, I think there's very much a desire to, um, both on the one hand, to, you know, to go back to some of the grand narratives mm. uh, or to invent new ones. You know? mm. yeah. um, um, I found it interesting when we spoke on the phone mm. recently, uh, when we had an introductory conversation to one another, mm. That you were telling me that is it all the students at Notre Dame have to do um, a unit in theology, philosophy, mm. and what was the third one? And ethics. Yeah. And ethics. Mm. Um, I found that I found that interesting mm. that these very um, grounding human um, areas of learning and, mm. and, and reflection were made a, uh, man a mandatory part of mm. being at the university. Yeah, yeah. Um, which then got me thinking a bit further about just the, just the role of considering our relationship to where we've come from, the bigger questions in life, mm. um, things that are bigger than ourselves. And I wonder whether um because i would argue that um what was happening there at notre dame is probably mm. a rarity and yeah, yeah. and that um it's not rare within the um, um range of catholic universities right. you know that okay. come out of that tradition that, yeah. that um i guess you call it christian humanism or or a, um yeah um the liberal arts tradition yeah. you know um, which was very much founded in a integrated um, understanding of the human person. Yeah. yeah. But very rare within uh, secular universities or modern universities. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that, so this mm. got me quite wondering. You know, what are uh, you know from the thousands of students that you've seen mm. come through your course? Mm. What are some of the I don't want to sound like a management consultant, but I'm going yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the benefits <laughs> the, the, to day-to-day -day life? KPIs. Well, not so much KPIs, because that's yeah. you know my predictable outcomes, yeah, yeah, and, I, yeah. and I wouldn't put a predictable outcome yeah, no, on yeah, this. Definitely not. But what yeah, are some yeah. of the observed benefits that you have seen yeah. for mm. students who've come mm. and been present and interacted with mm. it? Because it, it yeah, it, it kind of got me thinking about um, some of, you know, whether the fact that we put these bigger questions to one yeah. side then means that we left, we're left with this mm. bigger gap yeah, yeah. in who we are and our understanding as humans, mm. which then impact on our, our, you know, our underlying beliefs, yeah, which yeah. one might say is like the rudder on the boat yeah, that, yeah, that we steer. Yeah. yeah. Look, um, one of the first things 
I used to do with the students mm. that would come into my classes, would ask them, you know, why study theology, you know. And, um, you know, we'd elicit some of the more predictable ones, which is about, um, and, and they're valuable ones, about, you know, cultural heritage and about, um, I guess, being able to put yourself, uh, for this very much within the nursing students or those in the um, human services type uh, areas, um, put themselves in the shoes of the um, of their clients who may not necessarily come from a Christian perspective as such, yeah. you know, and um, uh, I don't mean in the sense of uh, um, understanding that religious tradition, but the fact that they might have one, you know, mm. that is of value to them, you know. Um, um, but what I um, like to uh, put forward to them is that um, uh, typically in an undergraduate degree in particular uh, they would learn the you know the what of their discipline and then the maybe the how um, uh, and then possibly the, the the why you know they get into the more analytical stuff and the mm. more critical stuff um, but it's rare that they would look at the who of their discipline and other who mm. who that who they are in the context of their Mm. Um, their professional lives and yeah. their um, their uh, their personal lives as well, yeah. you know. And what I would um, you know what I would argue is that of course, I mean, w what I used to do, I mean, what theology does, it's it's a framework for understanding the the human person, both the self mm. and uh, the person in relationship. It's only one way of understanding. But at least one way is better than none, no. you know. Yes. Um, and I sort of stress on them, it, you know, provides them a scaffold, will give them a scaffold. There's mm. many other ways of doing it and, you know, invite them to explore it. But at least it gives them some kind of um, a, a, a discipline, um, a structured discipline to approach that mm. um, so that um, they might approach other ways of understanding with a... A degree of rigor and a degree of you know structure and uh, and a degree of confidence as well you know, um, but I think one of the things that uh, certainly you know, um, theology as it was taught at Notre Dame and as I, I taught it was to get them to understand that they are more than well put to this way their clients and and themselves are more than their. Um, more than their illness, say, if they're doing nursing or medicine, mm. um, you know, more than their behaviour if they're doing education, you know. And indeed, you know, that they are themselves more than their, you know, uh, KPIs, as it were. You yes. Know, or their, yeah. you know, um, that there is, um, you know, they, you could sort of summarise it or um, it talked about the head, the heart and the hands, you know. Mm. And, of course, a lot of the, um, I mean, my experience of uh, secular universities, and I, I've been to quite a few, is that, the, you know, they're very materialistic places, you know. Mm. And I think um, the government policy more recently has even, you know, like totally um, re um, given up on, you know, the notion of personal development that, you know, I think they're quite explicit. It's about productivity and, you know. Yes. Um, uh, and um, developing a, um, you know, managerial class um, that that you know they are they are more than that. They, you know they're more than just a physical being. They're more than just a cognitive being. You know that there is a a dimension that you might call the spiritual. You know yep. which um, at its most um, fundamental um, draws attention to the um, to the uh, an awareness of one the totality of one's being. You know mm. um, that I think is valuable and that and that they find valuable. Uh, and particularly in, um, you know, they get a bit antsy in the, or they sometimes might come with a degree of resistance in the beginning. Um, mm. And, um, but usually by the time we get to the point of applying some of the kind of basic stuff to issues like, for example, around suffering and around, you know, um, moral decision making, for example, you know, mm. then all of a sudden it, it can get profoundly relevant. Um, yes. You know. And um, so, yeah, I think that's where, and that, and uh, you know, I've run into students like subsequently. Um, you know, I'd been teaching there for, for um, you know, around ten years or so when I um, when I finished, and um, uh, that's a lot of students uh, that I'd um, met over the years. Now, some would be, 
you know, indifferent to it. And um, um, but uh, I would, um, I was surprised at the number of former students who would approach me and say, mm. you know, you don't, you may not remember me, but I did your class and so on and so forth. You know, um, with very positive comments that that it, it's um, mm. they valued it. You know. Yeah. Hmm. So, um, so I think I think that's uh, um, th- you know it, the the idea of offering those three subjects as compulsory subjects comes out of a tradition, but I think um, it is of value. They are of value. Yeah. Hmm. For sure. It strikes me yeah. that it it helps to develop it in a in a compass. Yeah. Um, absolutely. The compass is a good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and um, uh, maybe a um, a way of if you know if we're talking about ethics in particular, you know, um, what does it mean to talk about the conscience, you know, um, and uh, that it's not just sort of some kind of airy fairy notion, but is actually a a quite um, you know um, sophisticated um, process of discernment in relation to yeah. you know, moral decision making, you know, hmm. um, quite a different type of conscience, the conscience that believes in the existence of God is a very different conscience that, that's sort of like a secular conscience that hmm. tends to be more, um, you know, um, or, or tends to give greater emphasis to the purely psychological or the, you know, the analytical. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but again, again, you know, it's just providing frameworks for, um, I guess, being in the world, you know. Yes, um, mm. which is not an easy thing to do. No. no At the best of times. Yeah, yeah, terrific. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I wrote I, I, I wrote down here. You know, it it, it struck me that um, you know, in, engaging and considering and reflecting starts to build a level of um, existential strength. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, resilience. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, um, and that's not just resilience yeah. in terms of, you know, I can take a lot of crap. Yeah, yeah. No. It's more a case of. No. Things might shift and change around me, whether yeah. it's you know pillars yeah. and external reference points upon which I derive my sense of identity. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I will still mm. be present yeah. in my connection with something bigger. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, very, very much so. You know, the um, uh, I mean, within the philosophy talks about uh, or the philosophy dimension, mm. but it's very much relevant to. Um, or actually, I'll, I'll preface it by saying one of the things I ask the students is, you know, what do you uh, want from from life? You know, like, and um, and I will say that, uh, and you're not allowed to say happiness, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, because that, that's, cause that's what a I, crappy blanket yeah, answer, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because of course that's what they want to sort of say. Happiness. Yeah. So, well, what do you mean by happiness and so on? But yeah. um, within the philosophy dimension, that we very much talk about the notion of eudaimonia, the Greek. Um, notion of human flourishing. Now, mm. um, you know, you can, you can. Um, at that point, that's one of those concepts that is very um, uh, traverses both pure philosophy, as it were, and um, or more traditional philosophy and theology. You know, mm. because it incorporates the notion of the possibility of suffering. Yeah. Um, but and and how might one might approach suffering that 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 you know you can still talk about um, a, a worthwhile life that incorporates the possibility you know like the very real possibility and more more accurately probably the reality of suffering mm. and um, but also gives some kind of um, uh, I mean, it doesn't, uh, um, uh, you know, reduce the intensity of the suffering necessarily, or absolve, you know, you know or, or, um, you know, um, remove the suffering. But mm. it does give a framework for perhaps understanding suffering, and how that, mm. and how that experience of suffering. I'm just using that as an example, yeah. but, but I mean, it's a big one. It's a big, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how you might. Um, work with your own suffering and the suffering of others so that it doesn't have the last word as it were you know that it's not mm. just plain dumb suffering as as i would call it you know mm. um that uh you know you, you, you um can engage with it and try and transform it creatively so that mm. again you know so that it um 
it's not just sort of something that happens and uh, you know you 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 know you're a vi- you're a victim if you like. Um, mm. um, yeah, I think it's um, it empowers the person, you know, and in, and indeed, I, I mean, um, uh, one of the I think one of the important texts of the last century was um, Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, you know, mm. um, and and in particular a couple of elements of that, and I don't know if you know his story, but he was a a doctor within um, um, one of the um, uh, con- German concentration camps, one of the one of the um, death camps, and who um, observed two things. You know, one is that the people who were most resilient were the ones who had a sense of hope. You know, that was invested either in a sense of faith or in a, a you know mm. a a deep connection with their family and their um, uh, you know their love for their family and um, but who also um, understood that um, they had a degree of autonomy in, in relation how to they would respond mm. to their suffering, you know. Mm. Um, sense of agency. And so yeah, on. sense of, a degree of agency, you know. Mm. And um, uh, now that's not to trivialise suffering, um, uh, and but to that um, having a sort of sense of um, as you say, agency in relation to your own suffering, I think is mm. uh, it's very powerful, but it's also very individuating. It's one of the one of the um, I think loci of our greatest sense of who we are as as individuals as well. You know mm. um, that we each individual can choose ultimately. You know how they respond to their um, to their suffering. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Is it, it's interesting you bring up mm. suffering because it has occurred mm. on the podcast before. Mm where I think um, as an observation, because we don't develop a relationship Mm. with suffering Mm. as a consistent feature of life, Mm. and I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who hasn't encountered any. So therefore Mm. it's there. Because we don't Mm. develop a relationship with it, because we're not also considering, you know, our existential nature, mm. then we push away from it. Mm. And I think it was Jung who put forward that neurosis is the sort of try the avoidance of all suffering. Uh-huh. And so, you know, any sort of slight depressive episode mm. that we might go through, yeah. which is an appropriate response to yeah. change suffering. Yeah is then seen as something far worse than it mm. actually is mm. and probably more of a, con- a, a constant than a, you know, a transitory episode that yeah, one yeah. might go through. Mm. And therefore we lose that sense of resilience and then yeah. a reoccurrence of that can increase anxiety, which can turn yeah. something into a more chronic. Yeah. And I wonder sometimes, because um, I come from sort of a psychology background, mm not clinical, more business, but mm. it was, that's the sort of bent to have a look at the individual. I wonder sometimes whether our rise in, in ang- anxiety, mm. depression, yeah. and suicide, mm. um, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting more curious about what are some of the elements that may be contributing yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, I've put forward on the podcast, maybe we, what would happen if we shifted things from an overly individualized focus Mm -hmm. and looked at the rising mental health issues as an appropriate response Mm. to to organizing principles that influence society that we swim in? And then where does that take us? Mm -hmm. And certainly you were talking about earlier on as we move to a more secularized productivity Mm. Um, management class, which I really yeah. liked. Mm. Um, we're becoming more material, atomized, mm. Mm. and so therefore that sense of meaning and connection and what have you mm. is downplayed, yeah. if not commercialized now. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm. um, we're observing 
the rise of life coaches and things like that, where people just want a sense of connection yeah. with and to be heard. Yeah. And and so I wonder often, you know, this is this is what has drawn me towards looking at philosophy and, and you know, seizing the opportunity to speak to you today yeah. Yeah. to look at well, what are some of the things that are maybe considered old school. Mm-hmm. I'm just that's the best yeah. phrase yeah, yeah. the most accessible phrase that comes to mind yeah. that we may be overlooking yeah, yeah. that are a key component of our growth as human beings yeah. that need to be in place that give us this sense of an inner compass yeah yeah okay yeah look um, it's interesting so so anxiety is symptomatic of the um, disintegration of fundamentals that that kept us healthy if you like or or stabilized us and kept us oriented that's really uh, so, so yeah. say that again anxiety is well it's symptomatic yeah. if you like of the of the disintegration of those things that used to orient us and right. uh, and you know orientate us and and um keep us i think you know healthy and um, yeah. you know and and obviously you know community i think is is fundamental to that you're right mm. you know we have this um uh, the the prioritization of, I mean you could call it you know radical individualism you know, yes within uh, as a um, as the um, well not the um, one of the key features of um, secular humanism you know? yes um, and this and of course it's, it's by and large it's a it's a fallacy you know we're, we're, we're what's the fallacy the yeah. fallacy is that we are, are you know like um we we have um that we are individual you yes know, uh that somehow or other you know we are we are islands unto ourselves yes and, and uh with hard you, borders you, yeah yeah hard borders and and that you know we we have the capacity to the idea that we have full agency you know that that, that mm. whatever we you know whatever we mm. Um, may wish to become, you know, we have a capacity within ourselves mm. to achieve that, you know. And of course, it's a nonsense right at the very beginning in the sense that, you know, we're born of parents, you know. Yes. And, um, uh, you know, so, so we're fundamentally relational, even if our parents are, you know, appalling people and, and abusive. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm continually amazed at the resilience of, you know, children and, you know, to survive the banality of, you know, sometimes of their um, their origins and mm. the, and the unintentional abuses that are you know visited on children. Yeah. You know, uh, um, for often the very you know the best of reasons. But anyway. Mm. Um, but but you know I think um, I think what theology can teach, and I think what uh, particularly Christian theology, but uh, yeah. but um, I think you'll find it in and what actually I'll, I'll name that right now. That is to say, like. Um, a Trinitarian dynamic, right? right, teaches that we fundamentally come into being through the other. You know? Yeah, so a Trinitarian that dynamic. Being. That is to say, within Christianity, you know, the son, a, um, a tripartite God, you know, the, the Father, Son, Son Holy on, on the Holy Spirit, or yeah. whatever other analogies that is presented in, you know, um, love, lover, and the beloved, for example, is a is a is yeah. a, a popular one too, you know, but that we are fundamentally relational, you know. Yes. Um, and, that, and that we are, we come into being through the fullness of the other. Mm. Uh, and um, I mean, that's uh, that has been by and large just you know abandoned. You know, we come mm. into being through buying stuff for ourselves. You know, through material acquisition. Mm. You know, through you know dog eat dog and and um, you know competitive um, uh, you know capitalism, if you like. Um, uh, and, and I think that um, that reality, I think, has been largely um, discounted, except to the degree that we might engage with charity to make ourselves feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, um, um, I, th- I think that 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 that. It, you know, I mean, it's one thing to sort of say, "Oh well, we're all in this together," but it's another thing to sort of say, "No, we're more than that." You yeah, know, we are. We, yeah, we are. <laughs> That's right. In yeah, this yeah. together. You know, <laughs> as uh, what's that saying? You know, one of us are in chains, none of us are free. You know, yes. um, is is you know um, mm. more than just a slogan. You know. Yes. Um, so I think that that um, that notion of 
relationality and community, I think, has, that has been largely subsumed by consumerism and... Mm. Um, well, um, we are so know. very um, individualised and isolated. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we have mm. our own tax yeah. file number, we have yeah. our own bank account. Yeah. Um, mm. yeah. you, you can't go and do my job to get to help me get paid. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's me or yeah. not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and mm. you know, as much as, you know, we still form families and, mm. um, and, and, and groups, it's still yeah. each individual in that. Mm. And, um, yeah, it, it's interesting that you talk about this because I ended up in a, a, a good, good-spirited um, exchange with um, a, a lady who I know who's, um, oh, look, she, she provides a bit of life coaching and, mm. and um, hypnotherapy and, and her opening premise that started the discussion was, you know, you have to go inwards to fix all the problems outwards. Yeah. And I was like, well, mm. Mm, yeah. these inwards, to me it was like there's your inner world and how you're, your inner mm. world, there's the outer world and there's the space between, yeah, yeah. which is your boundaries. Yeah. And, um, and, and she wasn't really having much of it. Mm. And I kind of had to point out, well, you are not... It's not in your interest to agree with me mm. because the actual your actual business model yeah, yeah. of what you provide mm. and the service you provide in the world mm. rests on the fact that it all mm. has to start with the individual, yeah, yeah. which is then back to this because mm. it's you individual on your own and we need to fix you, yeah, yeah. which is very... Mm. Freudian. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, in in some there are elements of what of that p- particular position, you know, and that's very much yeah. the stuff of you know of um, let's sort of say you know Buddhist philosophy and um, uh, you know the idea of enlightenment, you mm. know, which very much is about comes from within, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think what's happened is that uh, that's been detached from the notion of. Uh, of self in relationship, you know, yes. of being radically for the other, you know, that the reason you are doing this, um, this, this, you know, process of inner transformation, you know, yeah. um, is about so that you are more fully um, in relationship, in, in healthy relationship with the other, you know, with, yeah. with yourself, you know, with the small O other and with the, the big O other, if you like, to yes. be, you know, with the transcendent, you know. Mm. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that idea of inner transformation is really important. But if that's where it begins and ends, then it's problematic, you know. It's yes. It's severely problematic, yeah. Yeah, yeah because there, yeah. there are you circles. Know. Yeah, yeah. And you could even sort of say that the difference between Judaism and Christianity is that you know Judaism is is um, by and large to do with you know external realities you know God in history, yeah. and and the community you know and the the, the law which is um, fundamentally a, you know a way of being in the world but it, it's mm. it's um, it's uh, um, it's I'm just trying to think of the word um, it's 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 formalized you know highly formalized through the through the through the the law and through the commandments that that were subsequently developed, um, you know the over six hundred commandments that developed following the as Israeli society developed, you know uh, yeah. following the um, you know the the the, um, the offering of the of the ten commandments or ten suggestions as it's I think is a more uh, a more nuanced way of actually understanding yeah. it. But um, and and you know Christianity, which was very much about interior transformation. You know? Yes, um, that's interesting. You had the two. Mm, was, mm. One was very outside, community focused, yeah, yeah, and one yeah, was very much yeah, yeah, inner. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but right. but it's it but that inter, inner, inner transformation is about you know so that you are you know more fully able to be in uh, relationship. Build, be in relationship yeah. with the outside world. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean, that's how I see it anyway. That's my, that's, I guess, one of the, um, I guess, you know, understandings, I guess, de- uh, mm. developed over time anyway. Mm. You know? um, how, mm. how is it for mm. you, Jim, to look into the outside world mm. that we are in mm. currently, um, given the amount of time and consideration mm. that you've put into the field of theology and then using that as a lens to look more mm. deeply into the mm. world because mm. um, I've been 
I mean, look, I, I've been reading a fascinating little book called The World We Create by yeah. a chap called Thomas Bjorkman, who's been on the podcast. Right. And he, one of the things he, he charts is how, you know, as, you, as you sort of mentioned, we went through these um, highly religious period of time where mm. God was the highest authority. Mm. Mm. And then somewhere in the last couple of hundred years ago, we moved into this more sort of modern, rational way of um, organising principles where it was like science was the highest yeah, and yeah. rationality was the highest authority. Yeah, yeah. And now we've moved into this postmodern mm. phase, mm. which is almost like, a, um, you know, as, as rationality was a kickback against, mm. um, you know, sort of this organized mythical world of, mm. of, of of religion we're now seeing almost a kickback from this the, the structures of rationality yeah, post-humanist almost yes yeah. mm. that we've mm. got to and, mm. and and i get it mm. on one level mm. um you know my father's 69 listening to him growing up in the 60s and 70s mm. well 50s and 60s and then them giving birth to me in the 70s yeah, you know I, yeah. I listened to that and then how that's yeah. continued mm. and and yet so there's a lot of you know almost wanting to tear down hierarchies and and, and things of that mm. nature mm. so everything's more equal but at the same time I don't feel or see a new larger organizing mm principle or narrative emerging mm. and so the highest authority to me which i think you sort of picked up earlier on mm. the highest authority to me now is now the market mm -hmm. and economic rationality yep. which has no place in, mm. in its pursuit of growth in its pursuit of profit and yeah. therefore growth we can try and kid ourselves but yep. there is no space for life and humanity as, no. as in that because yeah. it is you know this central focus of moving mm. towards it to mm. growth at all costs yeah, yeah. irrespective of the damage it causes to humans mm. irrespective mm. of the damage it causes to the planets mm. upon which this big collective imaginary is circling mm. some might say out of control mm. um and so i guess they're some of the components that i'm starting to see mm. and feel about and and i wondered how is it for you to look mm. into the world mm. yeah um yeah <laughs> <laughs> big question no 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 it's it's uh you know um i'm just thinking of some my ch my children or my wife reacting to it when i'm watching television or the news you know and my there's a lot of exasperation there's a lot of exper a lot of expletives and a lot of uh you know <laughs> and <laughs> yeah um, or my daughter, who is, um, uh, or my youngest daughter, who is, um, you know, doing behavioural sciences, and but with a very much a social policy um, emphasis, you know, yeah. who, who, um, I, you know, I think finds my um, my frustration. Uh, she, I, I, don't, I think she's just surprised at the intensity of my of my. Um, I think what she might perceive as my radicalism, uh, you know, because. I mean, it's a wonderful thing when you get to, um, mm. you know, post work, uh, you know, post sixties, where um, you, um, you know, you cut yourself a bit of slack, right? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. growing old disgracefully, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think you're right. I mean, I think that's what's happened. I think science is being displaced by the market, you know, and of course, you know, um, and the and the fictions that support it, and of course, you've seen that with the. You know, fake news that that, that deliberate mm. um, uh, mobilisation of the notion of fake news to destabilise, um, you know, the, you know the things that we, the institutions that we trusted, i.e., which by and large, you know, for the last um, certainly the last fifty years, but certainly maybe the last seventy-five years or so, which has been science, you mm. know, and of course that's been, I think, rightly displaced because. On the one hand, you know, you have these quite profound paradoxes, um, of which the, you know, COVID's the most recent. Like, if you accept mm. that it did escape from a laboratory, on the one hand, we have the capacity for, you know, um, 
uh, eradicating smallpox, for example, you know, or for developing, you know, vaccines. But on the other hand, you know, we don't have the, we, you know, we barely have the capacity for keeping these things under control. You yes. Know? Um, and v various viruses, I mean, increasingly, um, you know, the world, uh, you know, things are becoming immune to bacterial, to, to um, the um, uh, antibiotics that have been developed and so on, you know, these, you know, mm. the superbugs and, and so on and so forth. Or alternatively, you know, prior to that, you know, the capacity to, you know, do these amazing engineering feats, including, you know, building armaments with the capacity to destroy the world, you know. So, I mean, the, uh, in and of itself, uh, investing some kind of moral authority into science is problematic, you know. Mm. But I think it's equally problematic to do that with the, the market as well. Yes. And I think in Western Australia, I think we have an opportunity to, or not an opportunity, we are exposed to the fallacy that I, I think, you know, quite up close, you know. I think West Australia is very much a, an aspirational society. You know, people come to West Australia to make money. And mm. um, at, at, you know, it's very much a boom and bust society. Town, yeah. And uh, once again, you know, you, you're hearing the conversations of, you know, how many houses a person might own, you know, and, um, you know, the, um, which was very much the, the stuff of... Um, uh, you know, barbecue conversations um, in the last boom, you know. Um, and that, you know, one of the consequences of that, that you know, moral, uh, money became its own moral authority, you know. Yes. And the idea that, the, you know, the people with the highest status in Western Australian society were the tycoons, you know, and the, um, the people who have made, you know, billions out of natural resource, mm. you know, the exploitation of natural resources and so on, you know. So I think... Um, I think that is um, something that we are exposed to, uh, I think, um, in fairly obvious ways here, you know. Mm. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the people who are unemployed, the people who, you know, were became quickly unemployed in the, you know, in the, um, um, which wasn't so much an experience in Western Australia, but in the Eastern States and particularly in somewhere like Victoria, um, realising very quickly that whatever trust they might have had in the market um, is misplaced, you know, mm. um, because um, uh, it's not, um, I don't think it is, I think it is beyond control, you know, uh, to, be, to be honest. And um, well, We don't um, seem to have a collective agency. No, when no. I want to say agency, yeah. I don't mean like yeah. a yeah. department, yeah. like yeah. collective agency yeah. From, yeah. from within us that yeah. is there to counter... Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's not, and there's some very, very strong forces that are, that, um, you know, the voices that question, for example, you know, the, um, the, uh, the authority of the, of the market or the purity of, of, you know, market forces are very much, you know, marginalised or um, disparaged or, um, you know, uh, caricatured in the, you know, the mainstream, mm. some elements of the mainstream press, for example, you know, uh, mainstream media. Um, for out of self-interest by and large, but um, mm. yeah. So, what um, what might come in to replace it? Um, I read a really interesting article mm. once on um, uh, that was looking at um, the, uh, I guess, the spiritual possibilities of postmodernism. You know, right? Um, and of course, yeah, yeah. And postmodernism, you know, was very much sort of. Seen as you know, devil spawn, devil spawn. You know that that rather than understanding it as really a tool of analysis, that somehow or other it represented um, these some kind of monolithic forces that were you know destroying the um, you know the institutions of that have that have sustained society. You know, mm -hmm. and, and particularly you know, you know the institution of the church and so forth. You know, um, and I think that was both a um, uh, a misunderstanding of the uh, of the power of um, or the limits of the power of postmodernism, mm. um, which was, as I say, which was by and large, uh, as I as I see it, you know, uh, tools for analysis, particular tools for analysis, and um, mm. ways to, um, I guess, position yourself in um, a variety of well, uh, to take a variety of positions to you know, an analyze or interrogate mm. or whatever, um, you know particular social policies or, or discourses or whatever, you know. But um, 
you know, within that, um, there would be, you know, places where, um, you know, there weren't uh, obvious connections, you know, things mm. were, you know, in the disconnections mm. that postmodern analysis uh, would often throw up. I think uh, I saw a, um, a potential for what you might call the mystical, you know, um, and of course, this was very much where, you know, one of the, the you know, the darlings of the postmodern movement, Jacques Derrida, Derrida, Derrida ended up, you know, very much uh, in the mystical. And it was very much my experience when I did a, an undergraduate degree in um, uh, what is now called continental philosophy or um, applied philosophy, which was mm. by and large postmodern philosophy. Um, that you'd get to what I used to call the, um, you know, the, the conclusion that dare not speak its name, you know, which was, uh, you know, the, the mystical or the, or the transcendent or, or um, yes. you know, the, that which was beyond language or beyond genre, you know. Mm. And um, I think, um, you know, I, I suspect that um, something of that kind um, mm. uh, might come out of... Um, uh, the you know the current crisis you know? mm. um, certainly I get the feeling you know there's much you know people are questioning um, you know through the fact that they're not going into work uh, you know well do I really want to be doing this you know yes the notion of a career that you know people no longer earn a living you know they have careers you know mm. um, and even and you know I've, I've seen the most banal jobs advertised as you know exciting career opportunities you know yeah and and you just think oh come on um so i think the space has opened up a profound space for people mm. to question you know a lot of the assumptions around um around you know the market but um around uh the the you know the the priority or the uh, you know of the individual you know the mm. um uh, radical individualism um and and its capacity to deliver you know, happiness or contentment or, mm. you know, um, or human flourishing, yeah. So, mm. um, so it's always like, um, mm. again, a reaction to yeah. mm. the sheer absence of connection, meaning. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and um, but it's a, possibly a reaction, but sometimes like a natural, um, it kind of, um, uh, that emanates from a space that's created sometimes by accident. Yes. For example, like mm. a, like a um, you know a, a collapse in the economic order. You know, like the global financial um, crash, crisis, for example. Yeah. You know, like um, crisis. You know, um, and like this. Yeah, um, uh, COVID. Um, now, um, and what do I look for? I, it, it, you know. It, it, um, in amongst all the, you know, the dominant discourse, I'm, I'm always looking for, um, call it signs of life, but um, signs of life, <laughs> yes. yeah, um, green shoots, yeah, 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 you know, like like things that I go, oh, this is interesting, you know, that yes. that, that where often at the micro level or at the at the level of the, you know, smaller communities, mm. but you know. From small things, big things grow, you know, mm. and um, um, that uh, um, sometimes ideas, you know, catch mm. the the imagination, you know, in mm. profound ways, and uh, have a um, have a uh, a life of their own. You know, um, I still believe in the greater good, and uh, you know, mm. um, uh, that good will triumph over evil. Um, just by the very nature of what evil represents, you know, yes. um, um, which is, you know, that lack of, um, or that, um, uh, the, um, the, dis the displacement of the good. You know? mm. And um, I think uh, by and large, it's, um, uh, it's largely irrational. Um, uh, that wonderful film, um, no country for old men, you yes. know, and the old sheriff just pondering the sheer irrationality of evil, of pure evil, you know, and not being able to make sense of it. And I think yeah. ultimately that lack of rationality um, implodes, you know, um, um, some, some terrible things done in the meantime, but still, you know, mm. um, so, uh, yeah, so um, by and large, I'm still optimistic. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess yeah. I guess for me, um, I, I, I sort of feel like the grounds for something to emerge mm. are starting mm. to be cultivated mm. in that, um, if anything, COVID has illuminated mm. um, our sheer connectivity. Mm. The fact as soon as we made hard borders, then all of a sudden mm. these new problems started to arrive because mm. we were like, oh, I hadn't never really thought about mm. people moving and goods moving and, mm. and, and what. Mm. But, and it just illuminated where we had got to yep. in terms of our interconnectivity. Mm. And then mm. we're having to make economic decisions blunt mm. economic decisions mm. that um to sustain life mm. um because of the way the place that we got to you know mm. you, you lock down borders you make people stay at home mm. they can't go to the jobs mm. but they need money because otherwise mm. you know there's mortgages to be paid mm. and there's food to be put on the table so it, but now we're lumped with this enormous debt that nobody mm. really wants to talk about mm. that somehow Australia is going to have to pay back yeah, at some yeah. point. And so yeah. all of these things for me have, have come together. And I guess it's, like I said, it's almost um, ironically enough, we may be in a place that's been so focused on the you know, radical individualization, mm. Mm. but not so much that sends that individual deep within themselves. Mm. And they're still, by and large, it's culturally normal, particularly in, here in the mm. sort of Western developed world, mm. for us to take our sense of identity and, mm. and existential presence by having, um, having um, almost like pegs and anchor points yep. in, in institutions that are yep. now going shaky, shaky, yeah, shaky. Yeah. Yeah. And so all of a sudden it's like, whoa, yeah. who, who, who am I then? Mm. You know, and mm. have I been putting my anchor points in the right place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, I've been anchoring against my bank account. I've been anchoring against my job. I've been anchoring against this. Where yeah, is my it? sexuality too. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one, believe it or not. Uh, yeah. You know, we are uh, coming out of the, you know, you know the idea of um, D.H. Lawrence, you know, I am my sex, you know, mm. uh, which is, you know, of course, fed a lot of the, you know, marketing and advertising and individuation and so on and so forth, you know. And yes. of course, I think one of the reasons for the, um, well, I guess the, you know, the moral panic about, you know, this, um, uh, the, the um, bringing the, a much wider range of, you know, a much wider understanding of sexuality into the mainstream. Yeah. You know, a lot of, it is, is precisely, I think it's another, element of that uh, decoupling if you like from those old you know certainties as it were yeah yes yeah yeah which mm. then as you rightfully pointed mm. out earlier on provokes symptoms of anxiety yeah 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 and so mm. with all this going on and mm. rising anxiety as i spoke mm. about i find it um uh, to me that seems to be the fertile ground for us to um, you know, our humanity will want to express itself somehow. Mm. Mm. And I believe we do need a connection to something mm. that's bigger than us, even if it's yeah. nature. Yeah. And mm. something will emerge from that. Yeah. I think we're also seeing some weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm. if you take, yeah. I don't know, just as an example, the, 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 the rush on Capitol Hill. Yeah. And led by a, QAnon shaman yeah, fellow yeah, with uh, big horns uh, and yeah, 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 but if yeah, yeah, the sovereign citizen stuff, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, so, so yeah. there's some mm. weird and wonderful stuff yeah. coming out mm. of that. Mm. But to me, mm. Mm. is why I was so keen to talk to you today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah this is right. Uh, I mean, one of the um, and you, you know, for example, you know, the rise of the uh, or the or the rise, I think, the emergence or the re-emergence of the hard right, you know, and, and mm. in its most extreme forms, you know. Um, I mean, by and large, they're, you know, they're, they're um, you know, clubs, you know, they're, 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 they're um, you know, groups um, that create a sense of belonging, even if mm. that which they belong to is 
you know, quite distorted and, and uh, I mean, they don't see it that way. No. But, but it's, you know, to the degree that they can articulate something. Yes. Uh, it provides a, um, a, a, you know, some kind of scaffolding that, they, you know, that they can yeah. understand and work with. It. And then... Um, and that and, something and, mm. can be delivered. Sorry about mm. it. And that something that mm. they offer mm. can be delivered personally to you. I mean, I'm pointing at my phone over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Personally delivered to your pocket that you can pick yeah, yeah. up. And it's like, yeah. oh my God, they're just like me. Yeah, Facebook friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Look, look. Um, I mean, I didn't uh, mention it before, but uh, um, this idea of you know the the spirit at work, you know, like within yes. the Christian tradition, you know, mm. you could one can talk about the idea of you know the the, the spirit you know working. Mm. Um, the the problem of that is that you have a a, a misguided understanding of what that spirit um, is constituted by then it can lead to kind of all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. Or we, it can lead to the justifications, you know, yes. for some pretty ordinary stuff as well, you know. Yeah. Um, what I, you know, you, you get, you know, who people who are very much, um, you know, within, within the Christian tradition um, who um, see themselves very much in touch with the Spirit, you know, um, but uh, and then sort of see themselves as agency or agents of mm. that, you know, mm. and um, uh, it can be um, uh, it, that troubles me, um, and particularly when it links up to um, previous notions of individualism, you know, and you get this thing. Uh, a, a, a wonderful Australian theologian, a guy called Tony Kelly, coined the phrase, or at least I think it was him who coined the phrase talking about a, an egophanic projection, mm. you know, where you project out into the world that which you understand as God, you know, and call it God. Yes. Right? But essentially what you are doing is projecting out your own limitations and um, mm. into the world, you know, and then on the basis of that, um, then, um, you know, uh, uh, arguing for certain positions and um, arguing against other things and um, um, positioning yourself in or seeking to put yourself in positions of power. You know, you, you're mm. getting elements of the hard right, for example, um, uh, very much uh, seeking to um, representation, public representation, parliamentary representation, you know, um, because they see that as a an opportunity and also a, a calling, you know, mm. and uh, um, so, yeah, it can, um, it can be fraught, but uh, yes, I'd I still like to think by and, yeah, yeah, by and large, I think uh, I'm still, and, um, uh, you know, optimistic that the, mm. the, the greater good will, will emerge. And, yeah. it's, I mean, as you put that forward, I was thinking, mm. oh, this is an interesting thing to consider that spirit mm. is at work. I had um, previous podcast mm. guest, mm. Sean Nana, who, Mm. One of the key things he was getting across to me is, Brent, spirit's always at work. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. you know, he's a proudly indigenous mm. man, and he was like, it's, it's always yeah. at work. Yeah, yeah. And so then, you know, you brought that up again, yeah. that mm. you know, you could consider that spirit is at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the zeitgeist was how it was, you know, understood, or, there's, you know, the spirit of the age is how, how it's, other ways that it's been expressed in quite secular, secular mm. terms, you know. Um, rhizomatic is another way that it was expressed in postmodernism when there were, you know, elements that they couldn't quite make the connections that could be identified as being connected, but the path between those connections couldn't quite be identified. Right, yes. So they use the term rhizomatic, the idea that somehow or other there's some kind of underground forces at work or or can you know um connectivities that suddenly sort of pop up you know but, yes um but certainly yeah or even in complexity know. theory yeah. there's you know, emergent phenomenon uh -huh. occur when they occur mm. it would be different even if you had all all the agents that came together to sort of all the components that came mm. together to create emergent mm. phenomena mm. um you can never really track it back and mm. and go Oh, that yet it's yeah. not predictable by yeah. bringing you know, like ten elements together. Yeah. It will create an eleventh. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Which right. is in and of itself, you know, an emergent yeah. phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
you know, some people are very uncomfortable with that, but... Uh, well, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and this comes back to having a degree of existential strength, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because yep. it's, it's letting yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the... Um, uh, I could be you know, generalising here, but um, I am of the opinion, I think, um, previous cultures, you know, my, let's mm. call them sort of ancient cultures, um, were much more comfortable with the, you know, both and rather than the either or, you know, one of the yeah. legacies of, you know, empiricism is a sort of like an either or mindset, you know. Mm. Um, and of course, out of that, I mean, have some wonderful things, you know, like, like um, uh, you know, um, differential diagnosis and so on that, you know, um, is, is, is wonderful. But, um, but at the same mm. time is a, a, a deep, um, I suppose, in some cases, suspicion of, um, and certainly um, an anxiety <coughs> about that, you know, possibility mm. that things can be both and, you know. Mm. Um, and um, But I also know that I think once you allow yourself that possibility, you know, like which of course is the, very much the stuff of Zen Bod Buddhism and the training of Zen, Zen Buddhism, um, that um, I think uh, it enriches... I think it empowers you, but it mm. also in, um, uh, gives you a, a much greater sense of, um, I guess, creative potential. Mm. Um, yeah, um, so, sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, if someone's been listening to this so far mm. and they're starting to think, um, crikey, I should start considering mm. some some of the bigger questions. Yeah. What sort of questions would you put forward? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, the two big ones, you know, you know uh, <laughs> who am I and uh, yeah. what should I do? You know, yeah. how should I be in the world? You know, yeah. um, I think how should I be in the world is, um, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I still think, you know, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty good questions, you know. Um, uh, I, th I think that that's, um, um, I think uh, you know, like as 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 a Christian, and and with the training that I have, I think my question would be like would be, uh, I think our our goal in life is to um, as fully as we can to, or, or to image ourselves as fully as we as possible, you know, mm. uh, as image in the likeness, fulfill our potential, if you like, as image in the likeness of God. You know? Yeah. Now. Um, uh, there are a great many um, barriers to that, obviously, in relation to you know health and education, all the stuff that social uh, justice teaching deals with. You know. yeah. But I think, by and large, it's both our responsibility to the, to the others that they, um, as far as possible, can uh, you know achieve that poten that potential. Um, and I think it's also our responsibility to ourselves. Uh, you know that we would mm. do that. You know, so um, I think, uh, however you might, um, you know, ask the question. The questions are about, you know, well, what do you know? What is my potential? You know, what, what, mm. you know, what am I? Um, I guess, what am I here for, really? You know, and how, how should that manifest? You know, or and what can I do to mm. to help manifest that? You know? Hmm. Um, I think the, I think you need to, uh, and who can I, what relationships do I need to engage um, to, to help me fulfill that potential? Yeah. Um, I think the sooner you let go of the idea that you can do it all by yourself, I think the better. Yes. You know? uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Man is not an island. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think it's. I mean, they're, they're, they're simple questions, but I think they're quite mm. profound, you know, mm. um, obviously, um, yeah. And then I guess it's not just considering it by yourself, maybe with a journal. It's also, mm. again, in relation with yeah. others yeah. and creating space for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, uh, I, think, I think time for reflection or prayer or call it what you like or stillness is very important in mm. that, you know. Uh, one of the, um, again, you know, one of the things that um, I would teach my students is that uh, 
you know the end of uh, you know the the, the 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 climax of creation is that time when God rested, as it were. Yeah. You know? um, and that's true of any creative process. The climax of the creative process is when you step back, or when one steps back and considers, you know, what one has done. You know, reflects mm. on it. You know, and either you know paints over the painting, or just you know consigns whatever you've done to the to the bin or waste paper bin or, or whatever, mm. or or um, says that well at this point of time that's enough. You know that that. Um, um, put that to one side and move on to the next thing but certainly that process of that time of reflection and um, mm. I think is, is critically important you know mm. um, uh, th there's a there's a really um, interesting aspect of Judaism which is uh, to do with circumcision you know right. which traditionally is on the eighth day of uh, after birth you know now of course um, that's very much about humans becoming co-creators with God, you know. Yeah. Um, that the, 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 the new creation begins, as it were, on the eighth day. And, um, uh, you know, and again, integral. So, you know, the, that humans are co-creators with God. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, the notion of circumcision is to point to the fact that we are not animals, you know, we are um, more than animals, you know. Um, and um, integral to that is is the you know the requirement of reflection and and prayer and uh, s you know stillness you know mm. so sure you know. so I think that's that's critical to that uh, uh, actually you know getting that time is is another thing you know yeah and, and building it into your own um, your own uh, you know timetable you mm. know to you know all the all the various pressures that each of us, all of us have. Um, mm. you know. And holding boundary around that. And, yeah, and, yeah. And then expressing mm. that individual importance mm. to others so that it can be yeah. respected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Otherwise you're having to fight for it. All yeah, time. yeah. Well, I used to sort of say, I mean, I studied, you know, theology for a long time. And um, it surprised me that, that, you know, it was a process of while it was of, relevance and interest and felt like the right mm. thing to do I would keep doing it and of course I ended up with a you know double masters and a PhD but um, at times I would feel very much that I was doing a lot of um, uh, talking about God and not enough talking to God you know as, right uh, yeah yeah um, and uh, you know that's that's uh, a, a danger of that process of mm. um, self-actualization if you, you like end up or, building yeah maps of the world yeah. and looking out the window yeah, yeah, rather than right. going for a walk yeah, yourself yeah that's right mm. yeah, yeah exactly. what has it brought yeah. to your life um what has it brought uh mm. yeah um well i think um i'm a very different person than i was 20 years ago absolutely when you, know. you started when i started yeah yeah it's it, it's brought a sense of fulfillment i mean when i finished mm. i i i you know, started postgraduate study back in the 80s, you know, and I abandoned it um, uh, after, you know, a, you know, I don't know, six months or something like that, um, because I didn't feel it was very satisfying. And I think it was a, a very good thing, both for myself and for, mm. I suspect I probably would have ended up a senior public servant in Canberra or something like that. And I don't think that would be good for either of us, you know, like uh, yeah. Australia as a whole or myself. Um, and I think, um, but nonetheless, you know, I had a, I had a, um, a sense of, uh, I guess, a sense of calling, you know. Uh, mm. And I don't mean uh, in a in a religious sense, but um, I've always sort of seen myself as a, as a creative person. And mm. well, I've always understood myself as a creative person. And um, part of that process of creativity is transformation. Um, mm. um, and I guess there was always a, a bit of a sort of sense that that process of transformation hadn't been completed within myself and certainly um, externally in terms of, you know, the various projects that I've engaged with over time um, to to the degree that I would be satisfied with them, you know, right. uh, uh, including, you know, satisfied with myself, you know. And I think... Um, coming, the self as a project. The self as a project, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that sort of, that notion of 
fulfilling myself as you yeah. know to the best of my ability yeah. you know work a, in progress yeah work in progress absolutely you know and i i mean that's absolutely still the case you know yeah um and i guess um so anyway um i think i got to the end of um yeah maybe the phd but certainly in the last little while where i feel like okay well that's that's been um I think that's complete completed now. That 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 particular journey is completed. Mm. You know, um, certainly in, the, in that teaching role. You know, that mm. um, role of the you know scholar, I guess. Um, um, and I think uh, it. Um, so yeah, I'd like to think that I um, have been um, a. Um, it's. Um, uh, empowered me to to be I, I guess I think a much more dynamic teacher I think mm. I um, I became a much better teacher and I uh, you know gave myself permission to take more risks if you like with, right you know the way I worked with students and you know what I put to them um, and I don't mean that in a in a domineering sense but just in the sort of sense that you know to um, to uh, be a bit more um, uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, just a bit more adventurous, I think, with mm. with the material at hand. You know, um, yeah, um, and I guess the response of my my perception of the way students responded to that over the years has, um, um, I suppose, justified that. Or yeah, so um, yeah, I think um, I think that's. Um, I think that's as probably about as you know what I would how I would respond to that. You know? mm. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's given me a lot of confidence in the process of life itself too. You that's know? interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, confidence in the process of life yeah, itself. Yeah, you know, life. Uh, um, you know what it, this 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 you know this human being. Um, mm. Yeah, um, mm. and. Uh, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. It's been absolutely fascinating talking to you this Great. morning. Good. Do you think there's anything we've not covered that are burning issues? Oh, probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'll, I'll just an anecdote that um, uh, I think some way into my first master's degree yeah i i was fortunate i've been fortunate to have some great teachers you know mm. and one being a, an old priest uh, who was in the area of um, sacramental theology you know right and i'd written a paper on the notion of landscape as sacrament um yeah um and uh i went into his office and he you know looked up and said um uh how are you going and I said, oh, good. I, I said, I think I n know enough now to know how little I know. And he said, yeah. he said, yeah. He said, yeah, the, the first 70 years are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> no. but, uh, um, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the beauties of any, I think any great discipline, you know, and, uh, or one great area of study, and it's a matter of whether it's, you know, music or art or whatever, is that, I think, by and large, I think you can grab the basic principles fairly quickly. Mm. But I think to... You Get know, that basic orientation. Yeah, yeah, basically, basic orientation, yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't take much to learn how to play a few notes on a flute, you know. But to, um, to explore at any great depth is a, is a lifetime's work. Yeah, mm. yeah you know. And um, I think that's, that's true of theology. There's a reason why... You know, people have been writing about this stuff, and um, I mean, it's I mean, it's continually renewing itself because mm. the world continually renews itself. You know, mm. um, it's just uh, an, another aspect of the mm. can you, in a continual recreation of the world. You know, mm. Mm. which kind of takes us back to mm. something we brought up close to the start of this conversation mm. when I asked you about what theology is, and you were saying mm. how it's asking those questions. Mm. So we can keep renewing, even though people don't like mm. all those questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. I really enjoyed this, Jim. Good on you. I, me too. Indeed. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. Good on you. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs>